It's one of those teenage romance films that isn't comedy sex romance. It's taking it very seriously, treating it like an adult film. It's grown in such popularity. And now there's a whole new generation of kids who are discovering it and really loving it. It seems to get better with age. The fact that people still want to talk about it after 20 years is kind of a great thing. We'd worked on the script for two or three years, and it was like, let's make the movie that we wrote. And that was kind of like the mantra throughout. And that was true through finding the right people to play the parts, to the music that we chose. At that time, if you were making a film about someone who's 19 or 18 or 20 years old, you know, you had to be kind of caustically hip. Our feeling was, let's give an audience credit for being able to see a movie about young characters that isn't just about being young, man, and going to the prom. It's about that, but it's also about real love happening and the harshness that comes with the joy and the euphoria. The roots of Say Anything are in real characters, and it's kind of always been that way for me because I love writing about people you know. And sometimes the oddest small things can be the road into a whole story, a whole movie, and a feeling that you want the movie to be about. The script was really good, but I didn't know Cameron, and I didn't know James L. Brooks. I sort of needed convincing. So I said, well, I'll do it if we can do this. And I was very sort of intense about it and probably a little bit argumentative and stubborn about it. And Cameron just never backed away from the passion of having me do it. The brilliance of Cusack is he, too, always wanted to give the audience as much credit as possible for a guy that had many layers and could throw a bottle out of frustration or anger. She won't talk to me. She won't look at me. Come on! Christ, Lord, what are you Get out of your head! But also be gentle enough to say, Diane, watch out for that glass. Don't step there. Just let me guide you. The way Cameron talked to me about the character, we sort of matched each other in commitment. I love Cusack for being almost militant about protecting that stuff as we were shooting the movie. And it's all there in his performance. Lloyd kind of had its roots in a next door neighbor of mine, a guy named Lowell Marchant. He would knock on your door and say, how are you? I'm Lowell Marchant and I'm from Arkansas and I'm a kickboxer, sport of the future. And uh, may I tell you a little bit about kickboxing? Kickboxing, I heard of kickboxing, sport of the future. I can see by your face, no. My point is you can relax because your daughter will be safe with me for the next seven to eight hours, sir. It was eccentric. It was a little bit strange. It was off the map that someone would want to do that. So it was perfect for that character. John Cusack is like bouncing off the walls. So he made Lloyd Dobler very energetic. He's very charming, makes you feel like you're the most important person. And he really loves film. Like anyone who does something so passionately, it's a real upper. What you see in Lloyd is what you get. And John brought a wonderful sense of just decency and childlikeness. Ioni Sky just seemed authentic and real and somebody who'd stepped right out of life. Cameron saw a sort of natural quality I had and an ability to be very emotional. I had to audition for Say Anything maybe three times. And I remember that after the second one, Cameron Crowe said, you know, it's really important. You have to really go for it. Like passion was important. I did get really into the character. I certainly was very different. Like I was really precocious with boys and very confident but needy. And Diane Court was very sort of intellectual, kind of like, yeah, I'll go out with you, okay. People thought she was snobby or thought she was aloof, but really she just was into schoolwork. With Ioni, she's very muse-like. She's not sort of the girl next door in any way. She's very unique, very intuitive and smart. I'll go. Pardon me? I'll go. You will? You can see the two of them, John Cusack and Ioni Skye, kind of falling a little bit in love with each other in the movie when they're just sitting talking or when he's teaching her how to drive. That's because they're so true, I think, to what they're saying and they're kind of looking at each other and really hearing what the other one's saying and on those days directing it, it felt like you're just spying on two people falling in love and that's what the movie was.
us. Intellectually, we love just being together. I think we both did have a crush or loved each other in a certain level. In a way, you sort of fall in love with the people that you work with when the movies work. You have to, I think. And uh, she's just a very special person, special woman. I give them flowers, I feed them, I wipe their mouths. No, but you stole from them! I make their lives better! John Mahoney is a powerful actor. There was a feeling that if there was gonna be a big name in the movie, that would be a place to kind of have a star-ish older actor in the character of James Court. But we tried out some different name actors in the part, and nobody held a candle to John Mahoney. You all right, sir? You okay? I'm incarcerated, Lloyd! I'd known John in Chicago. He emanates a kind of decency and a goodness, and to have that man be a guy who would be stealing money from these people and living this kind of a lie. It's terrific casting, and I think it really comes at you. I read for Polly Platt, Cameron, and James Earl Brooks. I called my agent, I said, I think it went well. He said, yeah, it did. They want you back tomorrow for a callback. So I went in the next day for the callback, and it was a disaster. I left, and I was sitting out in the waiting room, and Polly came out, and Cameron, and they said, congratulations, welcome aboard. And I said, really? I said, I, it was such a terrible audition. And Polly said, yeah, I know it was, but, but we told Jim how great you were yesterday. Oh, Mr. Taylor, you're a vision in green. The character that I played did have the best interest at heart, but nevertheless, he was seriously lacking in any sort of moral compass when it comes to the people in his charge. I just found that fascinating. There were a couple scenes in the movie that were based in real life for me. They were kind of milestone scenes. Milestone in that I just couldn't wait to get to them because for me, that was what the movie was about. One of them was the love scene in the back of the car because that had happened to me once where I shivered and busted myself for being nervous and not wanting to be the guy caught shivering. <laughs> Are you shaking? No. You're shaking. But I knew it was important to the movie and I wanted to get it right. And man, seeing them both commit kind of to, to bringing this thing that was so important to life was a huge thing. To me, what makes that scene is Ioni. She was so sort of open and loving and raw and real. The funny thing, though, about that scene is because John Cusack really goes for it as an actor, and they did one of those tests where they show the film to an audience, and they have to write a survey of what they think of the film. So that scene, they picked a take, one of the takes where John Cusack's really going for it, because he kept saying, squirt me with a lot of, make me really sweaty, and he's really shaking, and the audience thought that the character was dying, and so they had to pick another take. The party was fun. Usually filming parties is very stressful because you do it over the course of a few days. When you have that many extras, it's a nightmare usually. And in this case, there was an exciting atmosphere. It was fun. We had three days where we filmed those scenes and everybody kind of partied. We had a big tent up, played a lot of music and learned then that you can play music on the set and get everybody into the spirit of something other than making a movie. Listen, man. I need you to be the key master. Oh, I was a very responsible young man you're out with tonight. I was Thanks a lot, Lloyd. Eric Stoltz was actually a PA on Say Anything as well, which is he was bringing coffee to John Cusack and working with the other actors, and he acts in it too. Sadly, I made him play the rooster. <laughs> Your only mistake is that you didn't dump her first. Right. Diane Court is a show pony. I you mean the stallion, much. my friend. Jeremy Piven always was a force. You give him the opportunity to act, he's gonna give you what's on that page, and he's gonna give you an explosion, too. <laughs> he literally comes flying into the movie at one point. Give me my firebird key! You must chill! And he and Cusack are longtime friends. I love you, man. All right, I love you too. Go to sleep. What for? I'm buzzed. <laughs> All right. Their thing together is always amazing to watch. Oh my God. Jason Gould, who plays Mike Cameron, is the son of Barbara Streisand and also a filmmaker. He's that guy you knew at school that had the hairdo, and the hair defined who he was. Even though his moment is kind of smallish, he's so memorable as the guy that they have to give the ride home to. Oops, excuse me. 
John Cusack really kind of wanted to make sure that there was a little bit of a political slant to Lloyd. And I dug that. Like, you know, Lloyd has politics, man. Lloyd has a problem with Ronald Reagan. One day he showed up and he had this, this thick manifesto that he'd written. And this was the scene at the dinner table where Lloyd comes over and, and is sitting at the table with James Court. What are your plans for the future? During that speech, I said to Cameron, we need to have him have a, a worldview, have a sense of the world he lived in, have a point of view about it. Cameron Crowe's like, this is brilliant. You have to say it. We had built a speech out of John's manifesto. And in there was, I don't want to buy, sell, or process anything, or I don't want to sell anything bought or processed, or buy anything sold or processed, or process anything sold, bought. What was funny was it was so fresh that we both had to like scramble to keep track of what this speech was. And the takes that I used in the movie involved John himself kind of working his way back through this speech that we just worked out. Or process anything so bought. What's amazing is he was so in character that it comes off as Lloyd, nervous, stumbling through what he's trying to say and eventually getting to the thing that was important, which is I just want to be with your daughter. No, really. I'm totally and completely serious. The boombox scene was just an idea that came winging in out of nowhere that this guy who wanted to always pay tribute to this girl that he felt so deeply about would actually try and wrench his way back into her heart using a reminder of their night together. We kind of went back and forth a bit about, is he holding up the boom box? Is the boom box on a car with him standing nearby? And this kind of debate went on throughout the movie. Mark? We shot it several different ways. And it wasn't quite right. On the last day of filming, we filmed the scene where Lloyd points out the glass in the uh, parking lot of the 7-Eleven. And across the street is this park. And the sun is now starting to go down a little bit. The great Laszlo Kovacs says, I have found a spot in the park across the street. Let's give this boombox scene another shot. I have the perfect place. And literally, it happened as the sun went down on the last day of filming. It was the last thing we shot. Mark. John Cusack didn't want to hold the boombox over his head. Cameron had to just insist. I thought it was too over the top. I said to Cameron, I said, just have him have the boom. We don't have him hold it up, man. I told him we should just have it sitting on the hood of the car. You know, so I did, we did a bunch of shots. And Cameron was like, you're wrong. You're crazy. You got to do this. You got to do this. And he was like, trust me. I was like, well, I don't know. I thought it was really important that he hold up the boombox because he's defiant in his love for her. He's he's not being subservient. It's not very romantic. He's like still just holding on, holding on to some version of his pride, and it's not angry, but it's there's a defiance to it. It always felt right for the movie, and it felt important as part of Lloyd's story and their love affair. It was always a matter of what was the song. Cameron and I both love music, so we were giving each other tapes all the time and saying, what about this song, what about that song? The problem was nothing fit the complexity of John's face in the scene. And then one day I was driving to the editing room. I was just playing a tape from our wedding, Nancy and my wedding. And one of the songs on the tape was In Your Eyes by Peter Gabriel. And all of a sudden it was like, it's gonna work. Cameron came in one morning and just this grin across his face and goes, well, I think I've got it. And I ran into the editing room with this tape and we put it up against the movie and we played it. When the Peter Gabriel thing came on, we sort of, everybody knew that was it. And it was like, oh my God, it works. So we sent Peter Gabriel a tape of, of Say Anything. And I waited with bated breath for his response. No noise, no sound, no movement, nothing. And finally, I heard, uh, call this number at this time, and it was early in the morning, and Peter Gabriel wants to talk to you about using in your eyes. So I remember calling this number in Germany or Europe, and suddenly there was this kind of small Peter Gabriel voice on the other end of the phone saying, yes, hello, Cameron. Well, um, I've watched your movie, and I have to say, I can't give you the song. I'm like, wow, 
and I was crushed. As I was starting to hang up the phone, I had to ask him, you know, so I like, pulled the phone up and he was still there and I go, why can't I use the song? He goes, well, when he takes the overdose, it doesn't quite work for me and what the song is about. And I go, the overdose? And he goes, yes, isn't this the John Belushi movie? I go, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm another movie. He was being overwhelmed with screenplays from John Belushi biopics to, to Cameron. Oh, yeah, the high school movie. I go, yeah, he goes, I haven't watched it yet. And I go, oh, please watch the high school movie. A couple days later, we got the message back that he said it's okay to use the song. That song in your eyes is just a pure love song. That was one of those great blessings. Cameron and I, of course, had the luxury of having pretty great guitarists in the room with us the majority of the time, and that was Nancy Wilson. Nancy Wilson is my wife, and she's my favorite guitarist. Her beautifully soulful, reckless and free acoustic guitar playing became yet another clue to what the movie was gonna be. That you mix rock with that kind of fluttering anticipation of love that's starting to happen, and that's Nancy. This was my first foray into any kind of scoring work at all. Cameron has songs in mind for scenes while he's writing scenes, and he'll play songs on the set. He was looking for something looser, a little more rocking, off the cuff. The most fun thing I think that's happened in being able to make movies after Say Anything is uh, Nancy and I write fake songs. And it started with us deciding that we were going to write the entire catalog of Corey's songs about Joe. I wrote 63 songs this year. They're all about Joe, and I'm going to play every single one of them tonight. Lily Taylor, her character was just so, so perfect and hysterical. She started singing, That'll never be me. That'll never be me. That'll never be, never be me, no. That'll never be me, that'll never be me. We laughed every time we heard it. We had so much fun writing the Corey and Joe songs. And then, of course, what to me is now iconic, and that's Joe Lies. Joe Lies. When he cries. Joe Lies has a million verses. We could do a whole album or two, a box set, really, of Joe songs. He's very talented, you know? Steve, why do you think I keep her tapes? It's gonna be valuable someday. Lily Taylor and Nancy got together. I came in and we had a couple of sessions, rock school. <laughs> she learned the guitar for the movie. I remember her practicing chords. It's one of my favorite parts of the movie when Lily is busting out the Joe songs. No, never, ever, ever, don't you ever think it! Back on action, walking place. Cameron Crowe is very good at not appearing nervous, but this, of course, directing his first movie was a huge deal. Cut. He didn't quite know how to talk to actors. In my case, not wanting to tell me or give me a line reading on a line. How do you want me to say it, Cameron? Well, you know, uh, just just try something else. All right, so three takes later. Is that it? No, it's not quite. So, Cameron, please tell me how to say it. Just give me a line reading. Oh, I couldn't do that, John. I couldn't give an actor a line reading. Please, you have to. I don't know what you... And finally he did, and of course, boom. So that might have been the only giveaway that he was a freshman director, in that he didn't quite have the, the language. At one point, we were trying to do a scene, trying to get something, and, and he sort of walked out, and I didn't know what he thought. I got mad at him, I said, you know, just tell me whether I got it or tell me whether I didn't, but just don't walk out and tell me nothing. Cusack kind of said, hey, come here, come here, come here. And we went for a little walk, and he said, you know, I've worked with some really great directors. And I want to tell you what the great directors have in common. It's a direct line between you, the actor, and the director. And when you finish a take, you can look in the eyes of the director and know how you did. And he said, that is what I've found to be essential for a director and an actor throwing down together. And I've thought of that every time I've directed since because you do want that and you need that. And it's the best advice I've ever gotten, really, on directing. And it came from Cusack. I think we just established this thing, which is like, both of us care so much about this, and we established it very early on and became a really tight bond. Cameron's style is to let you do what you want. He doesn't overload you. He pretty much lets you feel it out and see what you're doing. 
what he did a little bit is you, he says, this is what the scene's about, talk, and he'll write down, like, you'll sort of improvise, and then he'll write down what you say, and then he'll come back and have a new scene that has some of the natural things that happened. He just has this, like, quiet passion. There's just something about the way he writes and films relationships that you just can't stop watching. You just get completely pulled in. Wing adjustments. You don't know how it's gonna end up, but that's also what I love about the film, too, is these things don't get resolved or tied up into a neat little bundle. You have the very romantic, idealistic shot of them going off together, not knowing what's gonna happen, but the film doesn't end with any resolution with Diane and James Court. I got a question. If you guys know so much about women, how come you're here at, like, a gas and sip on a Saturday night, completely alone, drinking beers, no women anywhere? My choice, man. That's yeah, right, man. man. It's a choice, conscious choice. It's a choice, man. The appeal of saying anything is first love and young love. It's just something you never forget. Everything about that film is just a joy for me to remember. Of all the films that I have done, this is the movie I'm most proud of. To end up starring in such a well-made film, being 17 years old, really, I felt on top of the world. There's a love letter to passion and music and the city of Seattle. All that stuff served me at a young age, and I've kind of uh, listened to that voice ever since. He's a wonderful director, a wonderful person. I was uh, so lucky to, that he wanted me to do the film and pressed me to do it.